Hello and welcome to Stories of Scotland, a podcast about Scottish history, culture, and quite often, castles. I'm Jenny, a gusty Great Hall. And I'm Annie, a salty sea cliff. This week, we're looking at the breathtaking historic site that was recommended to us by one of our patrons. We've been on quite a journey learning all about it, so thank you so much for the inspiration. And we also have a handy list of all the wonderful ideas that our Patreon supporters have suggested to us and we are working our way through them. If you would like to suggest an episode and join this gang to help us make this show, then you can follow the link in the episode description and sign up now. Today we are going to the spectacular Slane's Castle. Just to confuse us a little, there's both an old and a new Slane's Castle. And there's one that's borrowed and one that's blue. There's weirdly also a pub in Aberdeen called Slane's Castle, which has a spooky gothic theme, but I've not been there since my student days. Let's stick with the originals, though. Jenny, how do we tell apart old Slane's and new Slane's? Well, old Slane's has a pretty solid pension, And New Slains has a post-ironic meme page. (laughs) (laughs) No, I jest, obviously. But these castles do have a lot in common. Mainly being Aberdeenshire ruins that look out into the cold North Sea. New Slains is about five miles as the crow flies north of Old Slains. However, if you look on Google Maps, someone has very helpfully named the newer one Slains Castle and the older one, not Dracula's castle. So (laughs) I imagine at some point, vampires were getting very irritated at turning up to the wrong castle, and one of it took them upon themselves to do the good deed of letting other vampires know that this was not their final destination. Well, at least they didn't turn up to the city centre goth pub, because that would have (laughs) been dangerous for all involved. Are you kidding me? That would have been a great night out. (laughs) (laughs) But both Slains are pretty majestic just for this location, right? Oh, yeah. Both spots are prime real estate. And if you're interested in Hollywood fantasy movie set vibes. The castles would be a welcome asset to Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings. But also just for coastal views and an easy commute to Aberdeen or Peterhead. That's where we all need to commute to right now, Jenny. Peter had. (laughs) (laughs) I'd rather get eaten by a vampire. (laughs) I love Peter had and a shout out to all my people in Peter had right now. I've got a romantic Victorian description of Slains from a book that notes the various places of interest along the route of the Buchan Railway from 1865. Do you want to be an academic Abedonian who is really enthusiastic about the new train line? Oh, I do. All aboard the Jenny Express. Choo-choo. That's how I imagine an Aberdonian would say choo-choo. They got very low use. (laughs) Okay, Jenny, do the extract. (laughs) The new castle is a most elegant and ornate building, and sitting as it does, perched like a seabird on a pinnacle of rock, It seems the very idea of calm and security overlooking the wildest storms of the ocean. There's also an account of visiting Slains from the late 1700s. It's from Johnson and Boswell's trip to the north of Scotland and it paints a picture of New Slains Castle in action. Do you want to be a gentleman explorer of the north of Scotland? I feel like I already am a gentleman explorer of the north of Scotland. (laughs) (laughs) We came in in the afternoon to Slane's Castle, built upon the margin of the sea, so that the walls of one of the towers seemed only a continuation of a perpendicular rock, the foot of which is beaten by the waves. To walk around the house seems impractical. From the windows... The eye wanders over the sea that separates Scotland from Norway, and when the wind beats with violence, 
you must enjoy all the terrific grandeur of the turbulent ocean. I would not, for my amusement, wish for a storm. Such wishes are for sinners. But, as storms will sometimes happen, whether wished for or not, I may say, without violation of humanity, that I should willingly look out upon them from Slane's castle. I love this vision of Slane's. It's so powerful. You can see why it later inspires a lot of gothic artistic responses from the story of Dracula to Aberdonian pubs. But before we get into the rich and varied history of this Aberdonian pub, (laughs) 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 and before we clamber the cliffs to new Slane's, I would like to explore the story of why old slaves became old and a new castle was erected. It's an absolutely enthralling tale, and it all starts with a falcon in the wind. Let me get my feathers on. I was going to say, let me get my falcon call. (laughs) (laughs) Sometime around 980 CE, a Danish army invaded Scottish shores. It's thought that their plan was to land somewhere near the border between Scotland and England and then march south through rich English cities, plundering far greater wealth than they could in Scotland. The Danes landed near Forfarshire. Upon disembarking their ships, they thought it would just be a quick jaunt down to England. Alas, this was not the case as it appears the Danes weren't too clued up on Scottish geography, with Forfarshire being over 130 miles from England. In fairness, it is quite hard to navigate when you don't have proper maps. This is very true, Annie, and to be fair, the Danes were not deterred, and they got to plundering the nearby villages and towns, each day wreaking havoc whilst quickly approaching the biggest settlement in the area, Perth. Now, Perth at this time was no burgeoning English metropolis, but it was a thriving and important settlement. And so, when King Kenneth III heard of this approaching Danish threat, he rallied together a Scottish army and they marched from Stirling up to Perth, meeting the Danish invaders in a field at Luncarty, a few miles north of Perth. Soon, they were engaged in a brutal and bloody battle. As the fighting wore on, the Scottish troops began losing momentum, and in fact, they lost all hope. It seemed this vicious, unexpected Danish invasion was far too much for them to handle, and the Scottish ranks quickly began to collapse as the Danes succeeded in scattering the Scottish army. Now, it just so happened that a fellow named Hay and his two sons were out working their field that day, ploughing in preparation for the coming growing season. And what do you know? As they're tilling and toiling away, they hear a roaring commotion. Looking up, they see that the field next to them is the one where the Danes and the Scots have collided in battle. They watched from the sidelines as the Scots were broken and scattered and heard the triumphant bellows of success rise among the Danes. He and his sons were having none of this and they could see from their vantage point sitting on the fence that the Scots actually stood a chance if they just pulled themselves together. And so... The three men picked up their ploughs and their farm tools and ran into the fray, their new energy uniting the Scottish troops. And once Hay saw that they had managed to regroup the Scots, he led them back into battle to face the Danes again. Upon seeing this, the Danes thought that Scottish reinforcements had arrived, and now it was their turn to panic and soon their ranks began collapsing and scattering. And so the Scots overcame the Danes at the Battle of Luncarty. Some heroes and their ploughs. Indeed, Annie. And after the battle, the Scots marched to Scone. I suspect the Scots are marching to Scone and not Scone. Um, Easy to mix this one up. Scone is a settlement and 
A scone, or I'd call it a scone, is what you have with butter and jam. But once the Scots have marched to Scone, what happens next? Where he and his sons met with King Kenneth III. Having heard of their heroic actions, the king wished to reward the brave peasant farmers. He told Hay that he would be granted as much land as a falcon left off at canal should fly over before it settled. And so a falcon was let off and it flew for around 10 miles before landing on a stone. And so all the land between became the property of the Hays. The stone the falcon landed on is aptly named the falcon stain and can be found to this day in a field near Knapp. I actually found it on Google Maps and there's some lovely freshly ploughed furrows respectfully bending around the protruding stone. I suspect it's less respectful and more not wanting to break a plough. <laughs> well, that or well, yes, but they could easily have removed the stone because it is big enough definitely to just like whip out the field. Oh, but wow. they have left it there all this time. The largest settlement within the Hayes' new ownership was called Errol. And so the Hayes of Errol were founded. So how did they manage to follow a falcon for 10 miles? GPS tagging. Actually, yeah. Well, Jenny, like many of your stories, I think this one needs to be taken with a grain of salt. <laughs> me? Me? Outrageous, Annie. I think that statement needs to be taken with a grain of salt. Well, it's not so much the GPS tagging. It's more that the historical records are a little bit murky. And as great as this story is, we're unsure if the Battle of Lunkerty ever actually happened. The first written mention we have of it is by Walter Bauer, who was a chronicler of the 15th century. So this is a few hundred years after the supposed battle. There's a good few variations on the story of this battle, but what I'm guessing is that we have a real battle that's been mixed with a bit of mythology. Mm, I see your point, but human bones have been found in the area as well as the hilts and blades of swords, spear fragments, and bits of bridles that all suggest a battle most likely happened in the area in the 10th century, or thereabouts. I'm happy to accept this is a battle site. However, I think we need to be cautious about how much we can say about that falcon. Ah, uh, well, if that's not evidence enough, Annie, I have one more bit for you that might change your mind. It is said that the precise patch of field that the hay men were ploughing when they stepped into the fight was never actually broken up until the end of the 18th century. So their little furrows remained for hundreds of years. So even if people didn't write about it, and it is remembered throughout the centuries as a sort of myth, it's still an important piece of local history and pride. This is also highlighted by local place names such as Turn Again Hillock, where the Danes are said to have turned and run as they were defeated by the Hayes. I thought you were going to tell me that they'd dug up a falcon. (laughs) 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 Had some kind of ceremonial burial. (laughs) And they carbon dated it to the 10th century. And then I'd be like, aye, there probably was a magic falcon. No, I'm telling you about bumpy earth. (laughs) (laughs) Even so, Jenny, I'm afraid that the haze of Evil's story just needs sprinkled in a wee bit of salt. What is this, Annie Salt Bay's latest business venture? (laughs) No, no, Jenny, we have much less showmanship with our meat. (laughs) So this kind of clan origin story is really common. A glorious battle and then a mythological right to the land. It's great fun and I absolutely love these kind of stories. However, we know that the Hay clan of this area get their name from the De La Hay family in Normandy. De La Hay! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it sounds like a fun name to yell when you're drinking. <laughs> And there are records of one of the founders or perhaps early members of this clan as William de Hay, a cupbearer to the Scottish kings Malcolm IV and William the Lion. And unfortunately for our falcon, William de Hay steps into the picture to bear cups for our kings over a hundred years after 
the supposed battle and the alleged falcon flight. I can't believe you're even picking holes in the fact that this falcon existed. (laughs) (laughs) But you said it yourself, Annie. Things get murky when we look this far into the past. And I, for one, choose to believe that this tale happened and the haze of Errol were brave and bold farmers from Lunkarty. And so do the Hayes, for even their heraldry, that is their coat of arms or family crest, shows three shields representing the father and his two sons who had been the fortunate shields of Scotland that day. It also shows a falcon and two almost naked men shouldering their ploughs. Why are they almost naked? Surely people plough with clothes on. You'd be surprised at how spicy some heraldry is, Annie. (laughs) (laughs) No, I would not. (laughs) Okay, however the Hayes of Errol become the Hayes of Errol. This story is happening down in Perth. But this episode is looking at Slane's castle in Aberdeenshire. So how does this family come to inhabit these castles in the far northeast? A super falcon. (laughs) Oh, Jenny, this is Middle Scotland, not Middle Earth. Ah, a bird watcher can dream. (laughs) (laughs) Old Slane's castle, the original one, had been built by the Earl of Buchan a man named John Common in the 13th century. The Commons were a very powerful family who vied with Robert the Bruce for the Scottish throne. And Robert the Bruce famously murdered John Common's cousin, also called John Common. But, to cut an incredibly long story short, during the Scottish Wars of Independence in the 14th century, Robert the Bruce defeated the Commons. And after the victory he gifted Slane's castle to Sir Gilbert Hay, rewarding him for his loyalty throughout the wars. Ain't nothing common about that. So now old Slane's castle is in the hands of the Hayes. And let me tell you, Annie, these hands are going to get up to quite a lot of mischief. And that's only starting with the heraldry. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, have you heard of the Spanish Blanks plot? I'll be honest with you, Annie, I had not heard of it before we started researching this episode. But now, after spending a week of reading absolutely everything available, I can tell you any detail you want to know on the Spanish Blanks, Spanish Banks and Spanish Tanks. All right then, so let's saddle up the horses for the context wagon. Because before we link Slains to Spain, first we need to cover the (laughs) Counter-Reformation. All right, you better strap in because this wagon is incredibly uncomfortable. (laughs) (laughs) In the mid-16th century, Scotland undergoes religious reformation. And this is when we see a lot of very powerful people argue over whether Scotland should stick with the Catholic Church as it was, or try the new hot-off-the-printing-press flavour of Protestant religion. Now, none of this is pretty, and most of it is pretty grim, and it really just shows us the importance of keeping a separation between church and state. And then in England, they're also contesting with the Reformation, but in a very different way to Scotland. Thanks to King Henry VIII, the monarchy in England has already bordered on the Protestant Express. And they are keen for Scotland to hop on this train. And there's some success in securing Scotland a Presbyterian rail pass because Scottish nobles push for Scotland to become legally Protestant by 1560. A lot of transport metaphors happening this episode, Annie. (laughs) (laughs) Shall I get my pogo stick out and we can hop to the next century? (laughs) (laughs) However, there is still a lot of Catholic people in positions of power both nobles, monarchs being the obvious one, and they aren't too happy about all of the monumental changes taking place. And this is a really important time for historians of politics and religion. But let's just take a moment to mourn the loss of much of Scotland's artistic legacy during the 1560s. Because one of the things that comes with the Reformation 
is preaching that the idolism of the Catholic Church is a sin. And as a result, religious buildings are plundered and sacked. Walls with magnificent, detailed artistic murals are whitewashed and covered. And delicate stained glass windows depicting saints and biblical scenes are smashed. Oh, I, I do want to take a little moment to mourn the loss of religious iconography during the 16th century reformation it's really sad um i think we often forget to mention these details of the reformation but it actually gives us a really profound insight into the method of trying to change the beliefs of a group of people and it's fascinating because in the 16th century, they recognise that art plays a big role in how to convince people that something is true. Ye olde church mural is today's cycle of ironic political memes. It's a visual stimulus that people are exposed to regularly and reinforces them to think in a certain way. And I think with the Reformation, they want to make this really clear break from the Catholic Church and prove that they are starting something new. And to do this, they literally are wiping the canvas clean, getting rid of these old murals, which makes me very sad to think about. Anyway, the general Reformation activity creates a lot of tension between Scotland and England. So, an example of this, we see Catholic Mary, Queen of Scots, in a dance of thrones with her cousin, Protestant Elizabeth I of England. This leads to the arrest, the forced abdication, and the eventual execution of Mary, Queen of Scots, for alleged treason. But, this isn't just an issue that Britain is embroiled in. Let's take a look at this from a European perspective. Whilst we have Protestant England beheading the Catholic Mary, Queen of Scots, other Catholic European countries are watching this happen and are terrified of Protestantism sweeping through and upending their own centuries-old power dynamics. And so, these countries are actively trying to fan Scotland's Catholic embers into a blaze and give Protestantism the boot. Spain was pretty big into Catholicism, as we know from the Tribunal of the Holy Office of the Inquisition, or as it's more commonly known, the Spanish Inquisition. Bet you didn't see that one coming, Annie. You never expect the Spanish Inquisition, Jenny. <laughs> Couldn't help it. <laughs> the Spanish Inquisition was a state-sanctioned, torture-happy group that spent a lot of time hunting people they believed were heretics so that the whole country would be uniformly as Catholic as it possibly could be. All right, so not only do we have the Reformation in Europe, but we've also now got Counter-Reformation movements. Now, the Counter-Reformation is trying to prevent more Catholic countries from turning Protestant. And then it's also trying to reconvert Protestant countries back to Catholicism. And Scotland is quite an intriguing player in this field. This is because her people are split between these faiths. And for Catholic parts of Europe, Scotland could be a wee window into converting England back to Catholicism. And there we go, Annie. That's the context wagon up to speed. Next stop, the Spanish blanks. That'll be three shillings, please. So now we're going to the 1580s for two key events that are essential for the Spanish Blanks plot and the paranoia that surrounds it. First, we've got the aforementioned execution of Mary, Queen of Scots. That's happening in 1587. After her beheading, her Protestant son, King James VI, is left trying to make peace with her death and with the remaining Scottish Catholics. Second, we've got the Anglo-Spanish War starting in 1584 and left simmering for a while. Now, this was never officially declared a war at the time, but what we've got are two countries with incredibly advanced naval fleets, and these naval fleets 
are having wee battles to control the seas and their territories. So, salty skirmishes out on the waves. Some would call this the Spanish Armada, which I spent a very long time researching and found out I'm a fan of naval history. (laughs) You've always struck me as a naval person, Jenny. An enthusiast of the waves. (laughs) (laughs) But how do we get from the waves back out to Slane's castle? Ah, enter Francis Hay, ninth Earl of Errol, happily sitting up in Slane's castle. Francis converted to Roman Catholicism when he was quite young, and he becomes Earl in 1585. And he goes on to live quite an interesting and turbulent life. Can we just take a moment to appreciate that Earl of Errol sounds a lot like a tongue twister that you try to get someone to say when they're drunk? How many Earls of Errol erred over the Eregis... I'm done. Oh, imagine being the (laughs) Earl of Errol's Herald. (laughs) But this Earl of Errol is part of a counter-reformation gang of nobles in Scotland who want to disrupt the system and bring Catholicism back to the masses. Pun intended. (laughs) So how does King James VI feel about this little counter-reformation gang's open rebellion? Well, Europe is split by the Reformation and a lot of hungry eyes are looking to England and Scotland as countries in a predicament to see what happens. By the 1580s, Queen Elizabeth I is in her 50s and she doesn't have an heir. And this means that James VI is in a very strong position to swoop in and take his first cousin twice removed's throne. Because of this, he positions himself as quite a cautious negotiator and is actually fairly lenient with the Catholic nobles who rebel against him. He's aware that all of Europe is watching him and one wrong move could be very, very costly. And so he's keeping a close eye on the ebb and flow of the political and religious tides of the country and playing it safe. A good example of the leniency of King James VI is... His response when our Earl of Errol, Francis Hay, takes part in the not-quite-a-battle that happens at Brig Odie. The Earl of Errol was led by his good pal, George Gordon, the Earl of Huntley, and together they mustered up troops in what would be the most easily deflated uprising of all time. Oh no. <laughs> The Earl of Huntley had an epic blood feud with John Maitland, who was the Chancellor for Scotland. And so Huntley got his pals together, including the Earl of Errol, to puff themselves up like big toads. And as a species, Earls are actually quite closely related to reptiles. Indeed. Surprisingly (laughs) (laughs) cold-blooded. They decide that they're going to march, or hop over to where the Chancellor is staying and kill him. Wow, okay, that's a bit extreme. These earls are straight-up warrior toads. In fairness to them, the Chancellor, whose blood that they were after, was rumoured to be plotting against Huntley and his gang. So this was partially a defence as well as an attack. If you think someone's coming for you, you maybe go for them first. Mm -hmm. It's very... Typical early modern Scotland tactics. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Anyway, our wee counter-reformation gang gather an army together in April 1589. But then, in response, King James VI has to get involved and put everyone in line. So he raises his own force to quell this. Now, the mere act of King James VI taking his forces to Aberdeenshire has the impact of a pin in a balloon. The dukes explode? Yes, they pop. (laughs) They disperse the men at arms and apologise quickly. Oops, big accident, long live the king, great choice of chancellor and all that. James VI treats their surrender quite generously. He doesn't want to create a power vacuum in the north of Scotland. Better the devil you know, and all that. Plus, the king is good friends with the Earl of Huntley. 
So what's one minor rebellion between pals? But these powerful earls and the north of Scotland have another alleged ace up their sleeve. And it comes in the form of the Spanish Blanks plot. Late at night in December 1592, a man is arrested on the west coast of Scotland. The man is carrying some very incriminating documents, and amongst them are the Spanish Blanks. The man, George Kerr, is a messenger who had allegedly been intending to travel by ship to Spain where he would present these letters to the Catholic King of Spain, Philip the Prudent, or some of his nobles, in the hopes that they could conspire together against the Protestant powers on the British Isles. But the whole point of the Spanish blanks is that the letters are blank, right? This is why it's called the Spanish blanks plot. There's nothing written. Uh, Yes, kind of. There is blank as a turnip patch in January. For while there is no writing on the letters, they are signed and sealed by the Earls of Huntley, Angus, and, you guessed it, our Francis Hay, Earl of Errol from Slane's Castle. I'll add in that when we're saying that these letters are signed and sealed, it has a slightly different meaning to our modern version of seals, which would be a wax seal closing an envelope, is not what we're talking about. They are far more grand. In the 16th century, these seals are not trying to secure something closed, but rather they are a big pendant wax seal that will hang down from an important letter as a form of authenticity. It's essentially the two-step verification method for a noble's (laughs) approval in the early modern period. They have both a signature and a seal. The word seal comes from the Latin signum, which means sign or symbol. And so the seal is just a big wax picture. It's a symbol of the aristocracy that we get hanging in wax on the document. And you better bet, Annie, that the seal of the Earl of Errol had two half-naked men with plows on (laughs) (laughs) But why are these letters incriminating? Well, they are and they aren't. Because the thing about the blank letters is that they could be intended to have either the worst possible things on them, for example, a conspiracy to get Catholic Spain to invade England using Scotland as its base, So it could signal a whole rebellion for Catholic Scotland. Or it could simply be some Catholic earls supporting Jesuits in Scotland, which isn't treason, more just a group of people trying to uphold their faith. But because of the wide range of implications, paranoia about the Spanish blanks was rife. And an English diplomat even pondered on whether the letters were written in invisible ink, which was a thing at the time, apparently. Well, I choose to write all of my conspiratorial letters in invisible ink. But that's not the case here, right? No, they were not using this old invisible ink. Instead, they've got non-existent ink. Nevertheless, the Spanish blanks are sensationalised and King James VI has to reluctantly show some might against this alleged plot. And the earls involved are told to either renounce their Catholicism or face exile. And what do you know? The earls go out in style, with Huntley and Errol having a huge bonfire on Midsummer 1594 and drinking so deeply and dancing so long that it is reported that the wine showed force in their bodies. We've all been there before in exile. Have we? trying to say this. (laughs) (laughs) But after their big bash and a couple more skirmishes, our earls leave Scotland in exile in 1595. King James VI had tolerated enough, and he orders slains to be blown up with gunpowder, cannons, pickaxes and shovels. Old Slane's castle is razed to the ground. Imagine how you would feel If you're on the castle demolition duty and you're the person who turns up 
with a shovel and you get there and you look around and you see that everyone else has a cannon and gunpowder, I would be so embarrassed. <laughs> like bringing a shovel to a gunpowder demolition. <laughs> So now Francis Hay, the Earl of Errol, is exiled out in Europe. But during this time, his wife is living her best life in the farmhouse of Cloch Tau. Her name is Elizabeth Douglas, and she garners her own power in the Scottish political scene, apparently having great favour from the Queen of Scotland, who is James VI's wife, Anne of Denmark. They have a very sweet relationship And it goes to show this delicate approach to politics that is missing from the plots and skirmishes of her husband. But whether hard approaches or soft, there's no rebuilding old slains. And old slains remains a ruin to this day, run down by centuries on a stormy, exposed coast with no roof and plenty of pickaxe damage and a few shovel dents. It now sticks out from the landscape like a long, buried, broken bone, jagged and rough, and is far less imposing than what New Slains now looks like. Constant plotting, planning, scheming and signing of blank treaties was a given in the power dynamics of old, and the many castles of Scotland represent a system of power that no longer operates. There are, of course, many similarities with today's world, but Battles are no longer fought in fields, armadas do not sail for English shores, and King Charles hasn't ordered anyone beheaded yet. Power shifts and moves, and over time has left castles like Old Slains behind. From the original builders, the Commons, the Scottish Wars of Independence and Robert the Bruce, Old Slains Castle was the beating heart of power in the Scottish North East and it continued to represent a pivotal player in the ideological, political and religious battles of the 16th and 17th centuries. Unfortunately for Old Slane's castle, it fell on the losing side. Upon the return of the Earl of Errol and his reintegration into Scottish high society just a year later, Francis Hay built a new, bigger, better, meaner castle just five miles away from Old Slane's. And this castle is called, drum roll please, let's build the suspense for anyone who's forgotten from the beginning of the episode, it is New Slane's Castle. Woo! Shame they weren't as inventive with the naming of New Slane's as they were with their heraldry. Anyway, this castle continued to be the seat of the Haze of Errol until the early 20th century. And oh, Bannock, does New Slane's castle have a story or two to tell and inspire? But alas, we do not have enough time in this episode for these tales. Instead, in the next episode, we are going to be looking at the life, legends and lore that swirl around New Slane's castle. With more than a handful of ghosts and inspiring one of the greatest horror characters of all time, it's going to be a great episode. I'm really excited. If you happen to visit Old Slains, do look out for the anchor that was salvaged from the wreck of the Santa Caterina, which is mounted within the castle ruin. It's incredibly impressive and it's a great segue into Scottish-Spanish relations if you suddenly want to boast to your friends about your new knowledge of the Spanish blanks plot. <laughs> but I can't wait to return to New Slains next week as we leave these cannon blown up and pickaxed ruins behind. A massive thank you all for sticking with us on the wings of this falcon through a reformation, a counter-reformation, a cannon and a castle. If you'd like to support us as we glide on the wings of this falcon through Scottish history, you can follow us on all social medias. You can also leave us a five-star review and tell your friends, family and anyone you know that has a deep love of Scotland or just an interest in Scotland about our show. If you're feeling extra generous, you can also sign up to our Patreon where I like to tell long tales about turnips and you get to suggest ideas that you'd like for episodes. An absolutely gigantic explosion of a thank you to all of our new patrons. Wendella. Nina, Robin and Jeff, 
Megan, Laura, Jessica, Alicia. To our new patrons, we raise a glass and welcome you with turnips en masse. You lend us your hearts and your hands to guide and join us for stories from far and wide. As you join our clan, we bestow upon ye blessings from Scottish tales and folklore lively. May you dance with grace like a fairy Kaylee and laugh with joy like Kelpies in a loch with glee. May your breath be as strong as the mermaids in the sea and your strength be as fierce as the giants run free. May your heart be as true as a strong unicorn and your courage be as steadfast as the warrior reborn. Thanks to our patrons, we can soar to new heights and we promise to try to bring joy and delight. From the bottom of our hearts, we'd like to say cheers. Slangeva, may our podcast last through the years. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Right. Slangeva. Slangeva. <laughs> From the story of Dracula to Aberdonian pubs. But before we get into the rich and varied history of this Aberdonian pub. <laughs> <laughs> I've just taken a mouthful of coffee. You can't do that. It's like up my windpipe now. <laughs> First, we need to cover the Counter-Reformation. But the Counter-Reformation is actually what my mum calls it when she gets her kitchen done up. too obscure. I just thought that was funny. They decide that they're going to march or hop. 